Hi everyone, really excited to be here today. My name is Sasha Dichnowski and I'm a business strategist. What that means is that I help companies and nonprofits and other organizations make decisions about what to do, what not to do, and how to do it in order to achieve their goals and ambitions. I focus on food and agriculture, and the work that I do with clients has taken me to nearly 20 countries around the world working on things like grains and produce, cooking oils, farmed fish, wild caught fish, all sorts of animal livestock. And what I want to talk to you about today is the world food system and also the U.S. food system and why maybe some of us during the early stages of COVID-19 and shelter in place protocols walked into grocery stores and saw very, very empty shelves. Why did that happen? How is it going to evolve? And what should we take away from that situation? Let me start with the food system. It's big. It's a third of global GDP and 40% of employment. It's grown a lot. We produce two and a half times the amount of food today that we did back in 1970, which is good because we have 2.1 times the number of people that we had back in 1970. So we've outgrown population. And you cut all those numbers together and that means we can feed every single person on the planet a 2,000 calorie day diet. But we don't. Our system, despite all the amazing aspects of it, still struggles in some ways to get food to every person who needs it every day at a cost that works for them. We still have hunger and we still have obesity, sometimes in the same community. In the U.S., it's a little bit of a different story. If you take data from the World Bank and FAO and cut it together in a similar way, you'll see that the average American consumes 2,900 calories per day. That diet over the course of the year includes 115 kilograms of meat. That's a third more than France and Germany and 60% more than Switzerland, also wealthy developed countries. And it's not just the, the quantity that defines our abundance. It's now sometimes hard to walk into a grocery store in the produce section and notice the changes of the seasons. Technology and global supply chains bring us food all year round that used to only be available in certain times of the year. So how does a system that does that for us on such a regular basis result in what many of us saw walking into grocery stores in, in March? Let me talk a bit about that. In order to understand and remember, let's go back to March 11th, 2020. Do you remember where you were? I remember where I was. I was working from home. It was a practice work from home day that my firm did. And at the time it felt strange. It's now kind of strange to think about how strange that felt because I've been working at home ever since for many months until today. Um, but at the time it was really strange and it freaked us out. So I went to the grocery store and started to stock up on food. And to be honest, it wasn't that extraordinary of an experience. In general, we found everything that I wanted. There was no whole wheat pasta. There was only whole wheat flour, which was kind of weird. But by and large, I walked out with everything that I needed. Nine days later, March 21st, Chicago went into shelter in place. A couple days after that, we had eaten through the mountain that I had brought home back on March 12th. And so I had to go to the store again. So it was a very different experience. I walked in and I could immediately notice that I wasn't going to be able to buy potatoes, onions, oranges, apples, bananas, eggs, flour, milk, bathroom tissue, like many other Americans. I stood there and I thought, how is it that this came to be? Am I going to struggle in order to feed my family as we go through this pandemic? And that's not a feeling I'm used to feeling. So how did we get there? There's two factors I'd like you to consider. The first is stockpiling. I was not the only person that did what I just described. In fact, a lot of Americans did that. Analysts will point to data that shows that U.S. debit and credit card spending in grocery stores was double what it normally was during that period. That's a big increase for grocery stores. Let's look at one specific example. Here you can see some data from IRI that shows weekly tuna purchases through 2019 and into early 2020 you'll see that on average, Americans buy 30 to $35 million of tuna each week. Doesn't really fluctuate that much outside of that band. Relatively constant. Now let's look at March 2020. The week of March 15th, we bought 3.5 times as much tuna as we typically do, and a little bit less than that the next week. We bought $120 million of tuna. Just for context, there's 130 million households in the United States, and a can of tuna is about a buck, depending on where you live. It's like every household in the United States went to the store and bought a can of tuna that week, which is totally abnormal. In fact, I didn't even get any that week, which means that if it was available, the sales would have been even higher. 
if there were more people like me. Stockpiling was a big deal. The second factor that I want you to consider is how food actually gets to us and the channels that are part of that system. So here's an example of wheat. So wheat in the United States starts with farmers. They grow it, harvest it, and send it to food processors who mill it into, into flour or bake it into bread. From there, it goes one of two ways. The first way it could go is through what we call food service. That's large restaurant chains, schools, things like that. The companies that are part of this channel buy lots of flour. They buy 50 pound bags, pallets of 50 pound bags, trucks of pallets of 50 pound bags. They are making a lot of food for hundreds, thousands of people every day. On the other side is retail. Single loaves of bread, pound of flour at a time. That's where I shop, right? So one bag of flour lasts my family for a while. I can't imagine having a 50 pound bag of flour in my house and having, it go, having us go through it in any reasonable amount of time. So that's important to note that we can't transition from one to the other very quickly. I can't buy a 50 pound bag and that packaging machinery takes more than a day or a week to, to transition out. Perhaps even more stark of a difference, there are companies in food service that are only there to, to serve food service companies. They make, they make products to very spe specific specifications for lo very large food service companies. They can't get their product to retail very quickly. It's this, so if you think about what is our typical purchasing pattern within these two systems, an example is shown here, 50% from food service, 50% from retail, which is, by the way, what we typically buy uh, in a given week or month. Re let's remember that shelter in place happened and food service shut down. Well, it didn't entirely shut down, but it went down a lot. Let's say it went from 50% to 20%. And then on the other side of that, retail went up from 50% to 80%. One side gets more than cut in half and the other side goes up by 60%, which is a big change. And because the system can't move back and forth, and because the system works so efficiently, on one side we have capacity idling. We have food that can't get through and get to market. On the other side, we have it bursting at the seams. And that's why in the same day or the same week, you might read newspaper articles that are talking about farmers dumping milk or breaking eggs, while at the same time you go to a grocery store and you can't find those products, or maybe they're there, but they're a lot more expensive than you're used to paying. So that was March. As we fast forward through April and May, I don't know what it felt like for you, but for me it felt started to feel better. Now as we get into June, I can go to the store and I don't have that same concern that I stood there with in March when this all started. Why is that? Well, a couple things have changed. First on the food service side, if you remember walking through your neighborhood during those months, food service started to figure out how to service food again. At first they were just closed, then they were open and they were doing pickup and they had figured out social distancing and that will continue to evolve. On the retail side, they put policies in place to stop stockpiling, so you may only have been able to buy one of a product that was prone to that. They also figured out what it was that we were buying and so they changed the way that they got those products to us. Whereas before, maybe we could walk into a soup aisle and see 150 different types of soup. Now you can maybe see 10 or 20. The choice has gone down, but they're getting us more of the products that we need. So from a consumer perspective, it's gotten a lot better, right? It doesn't feel as dire as it used to. There is one product category that I'd like to touch on where things have stayed pretty bad, and that's meat. So a couple things I'd like you to take away about meat from this discussion. One is that at the very beginning of the process, we start with whole animals. That whole animal is broken into pieces and then it flows through retail and food service in different ways depending on what the product is, but it always goes back to an animal. And what that means is if we take a product like uh, pork belly, which becomes bacon by and large, which primarily flows through food service by and large, and we cut that off, then that, that pork belly loses value. And as that works its way back up through the system, either the pork bellies that we can buy in the form of bacon need to be a lot more expensive to cover that cost, or because we have to cover the cost of a whole animal, the other pork products that you can buy have to increase in cost or we have to start paying farmers that are giving us those animals a lot less, or we have to start buying a lot less from them. Either of those things is a struggle because they've been raising those animals for months anticipating to get them to market right now. The other thing I want you to remember about meat coming out of this conversation is that the production environment is not set up for a pandemic environment. I've been to about half a dozen production facilities, meat packing plants around the world, and they all have a few characteristics in common. 
One is they're very labor intensive. There's a lot of people in those production environments. Two is as those have gotten more complex and the buildings haven't gotten that much bigger, uh, there's a lot of people. All those people are packed in very close to each other, cutting and slicing and butchering the animal. They're not standing six feet away from each other. And the only way to get them to stand six feet away from each other is to slow the production facility down and take people off the line or to close it all together, which is why we read so much about that happening. That is an issue that that part of, part of the industry is going to have to continue working through in the months to come. Again, but how do we as consumers interpret that? Are we going to walk into a store and for most of us, are we going to feel a challenge getting our caloric and protein needs on a daily basis? No, probably not. Is it going to feel like we don't have the choice and we aren't getting it at the cost that we're used to? Yes, probably. For the producers of meat and then other products, especially those producers that are focused on food service, are going to continue to struggle and have to work through issues as everything slowly, hopefully, gets back to normal. But for us as consumers, we can have some confidence that we'll probably be able to feed our families. So given all of that, what should we be taking away from this, especially with the consumer lens? Unfortunately, I think this is going to be a conversation that probably raises more questions than it does answers. The first question is, what about our own communities? So for me, that feeling standing there in a grocery store seeing no food on the shelves was the first time I even got close to feeling food insecurity in my life that I remember. But there's a lot of people in the United States that feel that on a regular basis. Even in good economic times, like 2017, there were 15 million households in the United States that felt food insecurity at some point during the year. That's a lot of people when things are going well. It's probably not that good now even. And so one of the things we should take away is that feeling of food insecurity. And remember what I said about the abundance of food we have in the United States. What is the right level of food insecurity for our communities? Are we willing to accept what the current level is? What are the things that we as individuals or communities can do in order to ensure that we get that to the level that we, we are willing to accept? That's the first question. The second question has to do with more of a global picture. One of the reasons why I'm confident in my ability to get food for my family is because of what our retail environment looks like. Here you can see a picture of a grocery store taken in the early stages of COVID-19 and shelter in place. What you'll notice is things are organized. It's inside. You can't see it in the picture, but there's a door to get into this building so you can control the number of people that are there. The environment can be sanitized and cleaned and the gentleman in the picture isn't wearing a mask, but if the picture were taken now, he would be. So we can get food to people in a clean way. What we see in this picture is a woman selling cassava in a food market in Ghana. What's different about this picture than the other one we just looked at? Well, she's selling through a food stall. It's maybe only six feet at most wide. There's a bunch of other food stalls around her. It's outdoors, there's multiple points of entry, and this is how her community gets food. It's much harder to control the environment and people are gonna pack in there during the day. Cities like the one that she's in are gonna to have to make a choice on whether or not they control access to food or if they allow people to go to gathering places like this and potentially get infected with the virus. And no matter what they choose, that's going to increase food insecurity. There's either a, I got sick and I can't provide for my family the way I could, or you've restricted my access to food. That's a tough choice, and what it means is that the hundreds of millions of people that experience food insecurity in a good time, are, that's going to increase by another hundreds of millions of people. As things get more comfortable and normal for us, are we looking around our global communities and seeing if what we can do for the most vulnerable populations? The last question I'm gonna leave you with is probably the biggest and the toughest. One observation as part of that, though, is Think about how quickly the food system did adjust to give us what we needed when our needs changed. When we started purchasing different things in different places, it adjusted. It was not great, but it moved relatively quickly. That shows us that we as producers have power over how the food system works. And yes, there's a lot of companies that operate there that can make choices that influence what's available to us, but we do have power. And when I told you the stats about the world where we do have the capability to feed everyone on the planet a 2,000 calorie a day diet, we have the capability. There's also a lot of people involved in this, 40% of global employment. There's also a lot of land and water and other natural resources that are used to make the system work just by function of what this is. So are our purchases helping the system migrate to something that is the right level of humane and sustainable 
given what we want our world to look like. It's tough because there's a lot that, that a person needs to know in order to make those decisions and there's a lot of nuances. But I'll leave you with that big question, particularly as we think about what we want the world to look like post-COVID. I hope you stay safe and healthy. Thank you.